Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Bless, O Lord, the reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Today, this Sunday, we break the schedule of the Lent to celebrate one of the major feasts of the Church, the Feast of Annunciation. It is today that is nine months from January 7th, from Kerr 29. Nine months, exactly. So today we celebrate the Incarnation, the coming of Christ in the flesh. So if we are going to count days from today to January 7th, is exactly nine months. That's the pregnancy of St. Mary. So it is like today that the Archangel Gabriel came to St. Mary and gave her the good news. So we actually were supposed to read today the paralytic, but we are not reading the paralytic. We're reading the accounts of the Annunciation because the Annunciation is much more <coughs> important and much more worthy of celebration. And the reading of the church is very illuminating, actually. I, I, I was touched by the Psalms, especially. And uh, there are three Psalms, like you know, we read a Psalm and a Gospel at night, we read a Psalm and a Gospel in the morning, and we read a Psalm and a Gospel, we just read them now in the liturgy. The Psalms, especially, has something to say to us about the coming of Christ. They're very special. Two Psalms, which was last night and the morning, are talking about one thing. And the psalm of the gospel is another thing. <clears throat> more joyful, more exciting. It's like a, uh, to, get, to get with the psalm of the gospel. Uh, let me, let's go through the psalm. So first of all, if you look at the screen, <clears throat> the psalm of last night um, is Psalm 144 in the Hebrew. And it's, it goes like this. It's a prayer. It, it, in the, in the Septuagint says, I wish that you would bow down your heavens. You would bring down your heavens, O Lord. I pray that you can bring the heavens down. And come down. It's a request. It's a prayer. It's a, a plea. It's a cry. Lord, come down. And touch the mountains and they shall smoke. There's a hint here to the time of Moses. And I can see why this psalm is very close to that. And they shall smoke. Stretch out your hand from above. Rescue me and deliver me. Why this psalmist asking God to come down? He's asking not to have a visit with God or to see God. He's asking out of stress. He is distressed. He's crying to God to come down to save him, to come down to, to rescue him and sa save him. And this is an image from, actually, this is actually a reminder. The, the words here are reminiscent, is echoing Exodus. I'm going to show you that very soon. So let's go to that piece from Exodus. Um, three. This is where the angel of the Lord appears to Moses in a burning bush. You always hear the song of the burning bush in Kiyak when we think of the incarnation, the last month. So he, the Lord said to Moses from the burning bush, this is how it goes, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of, the, of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. It's a miracle. Why the bush does not burn? So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Then 
He said, introducing himself, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And then the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. He's seen and heard what's going on with his people. Then what he's saying, so I have come down. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. God saw, God heard, then what? God is coming down. That's the song. Oh, I wish that you bow the heavens and do what? And come down. That's a, that's a great wish from the desire of a person who knows God, who wants God to be with him, who wants God to rescue him. He has no hope. There was nobody that can deliver them, even Moses. When he tried to deliver the people he killed, that Egyptian made it even worse for them. And he had to run away, to fled Egypt, to flee Egypt and go back to, um, to Midian, to go to Saudi Arabia and live there for 40 years. Nobody could do anything about it. No one. They were all hand tied. So the, the psalmist is echoing that cry from the Israelites of Egypt, come down, save us. Then the Lord responds by coming to Moses and says, I heard, I've seen, and I came down. So he come down, and then from that time on, he walked with them. There was a cloud and a fire going ahead of them. There was water from a rock. There is manna coming down from heaven, sea to be split, miracles, right and left, plagues, because God came down to save. This is the first image. The second image is from the psalm of this morning. It's in Matins. And the Matins psalm is another image of salvation, another image of God coming down. And But this image is coming from the book of Judges. And the psalmist Actually, they're picking stuff that's very, very touching, very, like, it summarizes a whole, you can write books on this, of what happened. But they are picking the, the words that actually makes the summary of everything that they want to say. St. Athanasius said that the psalm is a garden of every fruit. So let's go and see the psalm of Matins. He, with a capital H, that's God, shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. In his days the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace. This is the Hebrew. In the Septuagint, actually it's more profound. He said, it shall, it shall come down like rain upon the fleece. Rain upon the fleece. What's the story with rain upon the fleece or dew on the fleece? That's a hint. Those of you who know the Old Testament, we know we're going to the book of Judges. Right? So when you go to Judges, chapter 6, there was a man, his name was Midian. And I'm sorry, Gideon. Gideon. And the, in the time, his, his time, there was an enemy, that's Midian, that's how the confusion came. Midian and Gideon. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midianites, Midian, for seven years. And the hand of the Midianites prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. They ran away from land, from houses, and they started hiding in the mountain. And this is even more. So it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would, would come up, and also the Amalekites, the people of the east, would come up against them, and they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza, and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor oxen, nor donkey. They were devastated. They used to do something. They watched until the, the, the threshing. You know, when they, you harvest, when you harvest the grain, and you take them to separate the kernels from the shells, you get a, like a little fork and you keep doing it 
up so the wind would blow the shaft, the, the lighter matter, and the kernels would fall down. This is how old people used to do the threshing. From afar of a distance, you see a smoke coming from the ground. And you know, yeah, there's threshing over there. So the Midianites will wait for them until they sow, they reap, they harvest, they, they pile, and they thresh. And they go for the threshing, because once the, the kernels are stacked, the Israelites will put them in bags. So they go take the bags and leave. That's how they did it. So that, that, look, you can imagine the frustration of the Israelites who left their land, going to the caves, coming to sow the land and cultivate the land and work all the hard work. And then at the end of it, they take it ready. It's like going to the grocery store. So um, they come like locusts and they eat everything and they take everything with, with them. Then in verse 7, it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent the prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord of God, I brought you out of Egypt, etc. Now, I want to go and focus on this part of the story of Gideon. The, the, the angel of the Lord came to Gideon and said, the Lord is with you. You will fight the Midianites and will conquer them and save the people. So Gideon ask a sign. Ask a sign. And then ask another sign. And then ask a third sign. And then ask a fourth sign. He was a little bit shaky. He couldn't believe from one sign. One of the signs, which is the second sign, is this. Okay. So Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I, ha I shall put a fleece of wool. What's a fleece? Sheepskin. On the threshing floor where they thresh, where they get defeated. The place where they get defeated and be conquered. If there is dew on the fleece only and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand. As you have said, you will save them by my hand, as you have said. So he said, I want to wake up in the morning and I go to this fleece and I want to see it drenched with water. And the rest of the ground is dry. And it was. So, when he rose early in the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. He could fill a whole pot of water from that fleece. That's a lot of dew. But then he looked around and the ground was very dry. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me again, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground let there be dew. The second part of the test. He said, God said, okay. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. Here, we pick the first part to think of it. What is the fleece that received dew from heaven that the rest of the ground would not receive it? Israel. What is that? Israel. That's Israel, but also in the New Testament would be who is the one that God did miracle to that never been done to anybody else? A special grace. The bedood fleece. That's St. Mary. <clears throat> she received something from God not, unheard of. The rest of the, the ground would never receive it. Who is the bush that burns with fire that does not get consumed? We, we sing that. It is again St. Mary that receives a miracle that nobody heard of. A version to be with a child. So this becomes a sign of a sign of salvation. But not any salvation. That God comes down to him. When he hears the cry, comes down and he delivers himself. God himself delivers. He leads the armies of salvation. He does the work. <clears throat> and then God was with Gideon and he conquered. So when you hear the the Annunciation, you're hearing a response. This is not the beginning. It's a response. What is the angel coming to say? God heard the cry of his people and him, he himself is coming down to save. 
That's why we're going to call the one to come the Savior, Jesus. Yeshua means Savior. Savior. That's his job. That's his coming to do. But he's not coming just because God wanted to do something nice. He's coming because a lot of people have been crying across the ages. He's been hearing the cry of people from Adam um, after the fall all the way to the second coming. All these people, including you and me. Including you and me. It's coming is to respond to the cry. He said it in the two stories, in, in the story of Moses, in the story of Gideon. I've heard the cry of my people and I came down to save them. That's why Jesus' name is Jesus. He is the Savior. Jesus means Savior. Yeshua in Hebrew means Savior. Hoshana. That's why they cried out in coming to Jerusalem. They said, Hoshana, Hosanna. In, in English we say Hosanna, but it's Hoshana. It means save us. That's the cry that was ringing all over history. In the New Testament, in the New Testament, there is, a, when we bring this to our own time, there is something that follow up on a personal level. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, Jesus speaks a parable. He says, and he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. These people, Moses and Gideon, had faith. Yet, it's a small faith, but they were actually persistent. Gideon says, give me science. I will do whatever you want me. If it's incredible, if it's unheard of, but if you give me the sign, I know that you're with me. So Jesus is saying to us, then he spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. He had no fear of God and didn't respect anybody. Now there was a widow in that city that she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary, my enemies. Somebody had stolen something from me. Somebody took something. And she goes to the judge, which is the king in that city, and she tells him, make justice for me. And he would not for a while. Why? He doesn't care. If he doesn't fear God, <laughs> that's has no conscience. And he doesn't respect anybody. Who can twist his arm? Think about it. You have somebody who's not afraid of anyone, including God. Can you, can you twist his arm or, you know, manipulate him or bribe him or get anybody to speak for you? Can you do any power play with this person? No. And she is the weakest and, and a widow in, in Israel at that time has no one. So he doesn't. And it's expected. He doesn't care. <coughs> But afterwards he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. She's going to bug me. I will not be able to sleep. I will not be able to eat. I'm not going to enjoy my life. So it's going to be bad. Let me get done with her. Then the Lord said, then Jesus said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect? who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Then he goes to say something very profound. He says, nevertheless, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, the second coming, will he really find faith on the earth? Meaning what? Let me just explain to you what's happening here. Who is this person? I, I keep asking this question. I bring this back because it's very important. We need it now because we're coming to the end of times. And faith is very little. It's almost null. So what is Jesus saying? Try God. If you persist, he will give you what you want. But you have to persist. Don't walk halfway with him. So he's saying, who is this person, first of all, that Jesus is giving us? Who is this judge? Who is not afraid of someone or anybody. And he doesn't fear God. It's got to be God. Any human being on earth cannot have that power, that strength. Every human being has somebody, except the Antichrist. That's what they say at the end of times. So the only person that doesn't fear God is God. 
and he doesn't respect any man is God. So what is this? Why we think of him as unjust judge? It's our image. You and I say, this is what it is, about crying to God. Why should I cry to God? He knows. Num number one. Number two, why does he care? God doesn't care about me. I'm not going to change what he decided to do. So I better not. Why, why should I suffer? Why should I beg? Why should I do anything? He's going to do whatever he pleases to do. If God comes down from heaven and sends his son <clears throat> to save us because of our cry, don't you think he's going to come to us when, on a personal level when we are in need? But ask for something important. So it is God, but God in our minds. That's how we see him, the image. The image of God is an unjust judge. I cannot manipulate him. I'm not stronger from him. I cannot twist his arm. I cannot force him to do anything. I'm going to be whatever I'm going to be. I have to deal with it myself. But then Jesus says, this is where lack of faith comes in. And it's a dis disaster. So he puts it with that faith thing that, no, God will listen to you. But here is what I want to say. If you ask about things that doesn't matter, I don't think you need to worry about that. God is going to give you what you need. That's what Jesus kept saying. But if you are in a sin and you're struggling with it, if you are struggling with weaknesses, if you're struggling with purity issues, struggling with addictions, if you're struggling with enmity and hatred, if you're struggling with despair, don't you think God is interested? He is very interested. Things that will keep us from going to heaven, God is very interested. <clears throat> Why do you think Jesus came down? <clears throat> to heal the sick? To give kids the, the colleges they desire? To have the properties that we're looking for? Is that what Jesus came for? St. Paul says, if that's what you're looking for, you're going to be the most miserable of all people. What did he came down for? <clears throat> Why is he called Savior? Save us from our sins. Things that we cannot be saved by any, any means. No money, no power, no friendship, nothing that can save us from. So Jesus came to save us. If you are interested in your salvation, he will listen. If you're not interested in salvation, and we're interested in things of this time, we will not get it, because that's not what he came down to do. Didn't, he didn't promise um, the American dream for example, or the Egyptian dream, or any other dream. He didn't promise that. What did he promise? Salvation. What is salvation? He is the Savior. He came to do this. So he is waiting for us to ask for the most important things. This is the rest of it. I give it to you. It's mine. I don't really, it is not really anything important. Money? You think God is not rich? That's funny. So he says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? If you are struggling with something, whatever it is, don't lose heart. He is called Savior. Just put yourself in a place. And for practical purpose, find a way to learn consistent prayer. Find the way. Find a way. Come up with an idea. You know how uh, Gideon said, here's the fleece. He's going to put the fleece and wait until the morning and wake up in the morning early to look at the fleece. Moses said, let me look at this very interesting scene. Let me go there and see from closer. Find a way to come closer. Find a way to have a persistent prayer every day. This is what he says. And we do this in the Agbeya. I pray to you morning, morning, evening, and midday. And that's why the, the Christian, this is from the Psalms, the Christians in the first century from the church canons re recommended and advised us to pray three times a day at least. But the, 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 the advice is, beg God day and night. That's what he says. He says, Will not who cry, will not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? 
That cry has to come to God continuously. Because you know what? God's not going to give us something that we're not interested in. How should I show interest even to myself? If I am interested, I'm not letting it go. Look at kids when they want a, a game or a, a toy. What do they do? They bother their parents. They don't let them sleep until the parent says, I'm tired of nagging. Here it is. That's what God is saying. If you really want it, show me you're wanting it. Don't say that God knows. God doesn't know. I want to tell you this. This is very interesting. God doesn't know. God knows here, but he doesn't know here. You want a key to God? Go to his heart. Don't go to his mind. Go to God's heart. And it speaks heart to heart. It doesn't speak mind to mind. God is not a chess player that you have to checkmate him to get him to do whatever you want. God is a father. You have to beg his heart. Okay? So this is the, the feast of Annunciation from the Psalms. And the last psalm, I'm not going to take much in it, is about a wedding. It's a psalm made for royal weddings. Listen, my daughter, and incline your ears. L forget your people and your father's house, for the king have desired your beauty. It's very clearly a song made for royal weddings in the time of kings David, Solomon, and their children. Whenever the king is about time for him to get married, when he's like a teenager or something, they sing that song, and the, the king of kings come to wed the beautiful dove, the virgin of all virgins, St. Mary. She's the queen, and he is going to have her for the mother of his son. So this is a psalm that is actually, that, that celebration is, is here. But before the celebration, we have the cry. And the cry is a cry for salvation. May the Lord save us and accept our prayers. Learn prayer, please, and don't ignore it. This is not something we ignore, but learn to pray from the heart, not from the mind or the lips. The heart prayer is known to God and is clear before him. God listened to it. We don't, I don't think that the Egyptians in Egypt were praying continuously from their lips. But what was aching? Their hearts. Their hearts were aching. The Israelites in the time of Gideon were not praying. They were actually not good. But they were under a lot of pressure. And their hearts were crying to God. Turn that into an, an, an active prayer in the New Testament because we are more aware of God's presence in our life through the Holy Spirit that's given to us. To him is the glory with his good Father and Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Amen.